So welcome everybody to today's behind the scenes look at remote learning at McGill University. Before we begin, I want to uh, share with you the practice of a land acknowledgement. This is something that's very important to us at McGill and more broadly, I think as global citizens, recognizing the history of the lands that we inhabit, that we work and that we learn on. Um, I'd like to recognize that McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. So we acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose presence have enriched this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. And uh, one, I'd like to add that one of the really neat features of remote learning is that people can join from all over the world to achieve one, a couple learning goals together. And that's what we're doing here today. So I'm actually joining from Newfoundland in Atlantic Canada. So I'd like to acknowledge that the territory that I'm currently on as the ancestral homelands of the Bayotuk and that the island of Newfoundland particularly is the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and the Bayotuk. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and just introduce myself. My name is Alex. I work in teaching and learning services. I spend an awful lot of time thinking about how students learn best and the unit that I'm part of more broadly spends a lot of its time and energy supporting McGill's fantastic instructors. And as you can imagine, getting ready for the first ever fall semester uh, at McGill, which starts in just over a week, we've been very busy supporting our instructors who have been even more busy getting their courses set so that they can provide fantastic and engaging learning experiences for all of McGill students and, the, and your children who um, are gonna be joining us as students uh, and are joining us now. So before we dive in, I just wanna make a few comments. So this platform that we're on is called Zoom. Zoom is one of the many tools that we use at McGill to support remote teaching. Um, right now, what we're doing is something called a fixed activity. You're all joining from all over the world. We're all here at the same time. And, uh, and, and that's really, really neat. Um, it's supplemented by a bunch of other things like our learning management system where students can submit quizzes or assignments and much, much, much more. Now, we're not gonna get into that right away, but if you have questions, I'll be more than happy to engage with you on that. Um, a couple of things that you should know about Zoom is that there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, you can uh, meet with people with great audio quality, video on or off, and you've got some really neat features. So depending on whether or not you're joining from a mobile or a tablet or a computer, um, the interface will look just a little bit different. But for those of you on computers, whether PC or Mac, at the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a little button for a chat uh, option. So if you click that chat box, what I encourage you to do throughout this session is to chat. You can talk to me, you can talk to me privately, you can pose questions, um, and we really invite you all uh, to make effective use of that however you feel comfortable. And I invite you as a place to start is let us know where you're joining from. Um, my colleagues uh, inform me that many of you are coming from Canada and North America more broadly, but I know that that's not all of you. And so really excited to see where you're all coming from. And as I said before, one of the really exciting hallmarks of McGill as an educational institution is the diversity of perspectives and that all of our fantastic students and all of our excellent researchers bring uh, to the learning environment. And that is as much true when we're joining on Zoom to do a little bit of teaching and learning uh, and, it makes, and it makes it possible in what is like obviously a very complicated environment that we're all navigating. Last thing I want to convey is we use the word remote delivery of courses, remote teaching, remote learning very intentionally. Okay, so we often talk about things being online, but an online course is different from a remotely delivered course. So first and foremost, an online course is designed from the get-go and it takes a lot of time, energy, and resources to be completed online. Now, a remotely delivered course is a course that's been adapted. It makes effective use of video conferencing tools like Zoom or My Courses, which is our learning management system, and other things to adapt a course that's normally delivered in person and allow it to be able to continue uh, in this remote context, right, remotely delivered semester in an online environment. Uh, eventually we'll return to being campus-based, but this allows us to continue our educational mission. And I just really wanna just highlight how fantastically hard our instructors have been working to prepare for this fall semester. And to note that uh, I spend a lot of time engaging with students and talking to them, and they've overwhelmingly indicated that this switch to remote has put a very strong emphasis on the learning. So we think a lot about memorization as being key to when, what we do when we're in secondary school. 
Well, in university, we think about understanding and applying concepts and maybe creating new, uh, new knowledge, which is exactly what research is. Well, in the remote context, students have been saying, well, I feel like I'm spending more time learning, doing things that I know I'm gonna do in the field, like apply concepts or interpret data, um, as opposed to memorize. And so, I mean, what a fantastic thing um, in terms of learning goals and keeping things about learning for students. Um, but also what a great feature that this current context allows us to uh, make effective use of. So without further ado, you're not here to hear from me, you're here to hear from two fantastic McGill professors, both representing our largest faculties, Faculty of Science and Faculty of Arts, and both of which are award-winning McGill instructors. We're gonna start off with Professor Laura Pavelka, uh, Laura Pavelka began at McGill in 2012 as a faculty lecturer in the chemistry department and after completing a PhD at the University of Western Ontario, she's been a leader in teaching initiatives and positive change for the U0 and U1 chemistry courses at McGill. So her focus is to improve the quality of content and student experience in these courses by updating course material delivery and assessment methods, as well as setting up interdepartmental resources for students and providing additional support for those at risk. She's been awarded the McGill Principals Prize for Excellence in Teaching in 2017, and I may mention that that's quite a big deal, and the Faculty of Science Leo Yaffe Award for Excellence in Teaching, most recently now in 2020. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Pavelka. Great, thanks so much, Alex. And welcome everyone. It's wonderful to get a chance to talk to the parents because that's something that I don't really get to do very much, so I'm, I'm happy to to answer any questions and share with you a little bit of what we're going to be planning for this fall. So I'm going to share a screen here so I can um, show you some information. Oh. Okay. Oh, I don't really want that. Okay, so the courses that I'm teaching this fall are the organic chemistry courses. So these are U1 courses, but I have taught a lot of the general chemistry. So if, if there's any questions about U0 chemistry courses, I'm, I'm gonna try and help out with that as well today. I teach with uh, uh, several other professors for this fall, mostly because I'm only teaching in September this year and then starting uh, maternity leave in October. So I have a bit of an, a bigger team than I would usually have this fall. and Three of the other instructors, so Dr. Sergis Singh and Dr. Laho, taught with me this past summer, and we've actually delivered two remote courses in May and June already, so a little bit of practice under our belts. I have to say they were much smaller courses, and so the fall is definitely its own challenge, but we have tried a lot of these things out with students, and there's been a lot of positive feedback. So, um, I just wanted to go through a little bit of how our chemistry courses in general are running. And this is fairly consistent across the Faculty of Science. We've had lots of meetings with different departments to make sure that we're on the same page and not overwhelming students with too many different methods and too many different platforms and things like that, because we appreciate that it's a big jump in general for everyone right now. And if they can streamline things, it's all the better for everybody. So in general, we've flipped a lot of our courses so that what would be traditionally delivered as a lecture is now delivered as um, pre-readings or concept videos, so short videos that students can watch when they have time to do so before a certain date when it's need to be used. So this is falling under the, the flexible timing uh, remote delivery option or asynchronous. And then we will have some fixed times with our students in tutorials. So this is where we have several different timings so that we can accommodate people across the globe and have tutorials where we use Zoom and we use the breakout room features in Zoom and have small groups. So even in our very large um, organic chemistry one class this fall, which is I think about 600 plus students, the students will be broken up into groups of 20. So they will be in what looks like a small class with a TA and a, an undergrad um, helper and I'll be supervising along with my other instructors as they solve problems and present problem solutions to each other and discuss in a small group setting. So those are, that's something that this remote delivery has really allowed us to 
explore, which is something we couldn't do before because we don't have that many classrooms that would hold 20 students at a time. So Zoom is really giving us some opportunities to try new things. And then, you know, to try and reinforce what we've learned in the, the videos and tutorials, there's lots of practice and homework that students can do on their own time. Again, in that sort of flexible setting. So whenever it works for them, we have lots of custom materials, problem sets, whole exam they can study from. Some courses have textbooks. Um, my courses do not because we've we've moved away from textbooks. So there's very low cost associated with with these courses. And then we have lots of different support options for our students where you know, there's a very active online discussion forum. We have um, lots of ways for office hours interaction, either with me or the other instructors or the TAs. And Fresca is something that uh, sounds a bit funny. So this is an acronym for the first year residence cafeteria help. Um, this is not going to take place in the cafeteria this fall. But we are still running uh, an online version of Fresca, which joins chemistry, physics, math, computer, or maybe not computer science, I think they're still on the fence, um, and biology in one remote location. So you can access support for multiple different subjects and courses in the same location, which is very convenient for our students. And then one of the things that's probably changed the most, so our course, course delivery has definitely changed for the remote uh, setting, but assessment has changed a lot. And I feel like this has changed a lot for the better because we used to have two midterms and a final. Um, they're you know, moderately high stakes and it was kind of our limitation. Um, for these classes, we do have labs. So that was also part of the, the grade. And we had a small quiz component, but now we have still have quizzes. That's pretty much the only thing we've kept. We don't have any midterms and there is a sort of final, but it's not really gonna be a final exam. It's more of an assignment. And we have much more regular small scale assessments throughout the term. So there's some homework assignments. There's participation grades for joining our Zoom tutorials and participating and peer assessing there. So if you're not presenting a problem, we have a very brief um, peer assessment form that the other students fill out to just give some feedback to each other and get practice at active listening, which is something that we don't get a big chance to do in a lecture hall either. Um, we have a new kind of assignment called challenge questions, which are just like kind of a hard question that pushes them a bit after tutorial and they're um, not worth very much, but it's something to get them thinking a little bit deeper about the subjects. And so these are very commonly recurring uh, weekly events or weekly activities. And when we did this in the summer sem semesters, um, the feedback was really positive because it, it's really hard to stay motivated when you're in front of a computer all day. But when you have, you know, very regular schedule of things to do, it, it sets you up so that there's not very much procrastination, which I think we're all very guilty of, myself included. And so if you're waiting for a midterm, um, things get a little bit pushed back. And I think in the online remote delivery uh, environment, Procrastination is definitely something that is going to be a big trouble because most of the courses have set up um, more regular small scale assessments. So having a, a set work schedule for each student is going to be very important. And we do have a lab component this fall for the Org 1 course, not the Org 2 course, and for Gen Chem we also have online labs. And they're not going to replace a, an in-person lab experience to the same extent, but it's challenging what we really want the core values out of that lab to be. So communication, scientific literacy, um, critical assessment of data. So that will all still be present. And so then I do wanna take you through a remote activity, um, a sort of example activity. And one of the platforms that we're gonna use this fall is called Visual Classrooms. And we use this in the, in the summer. And this is a really neat way for students to interact with each other and with their professors and TAs, either synchronously or asynchronously. We can use it either way um, with short little image based assessments. So I'm going to stop this share and actually go through an example with you. Just have to open up a different window.
Okay. So this is what the platform looks like. And so here's um, an example of one of our challenge problems where there's two structures and I mean, whether or not you're big on chemistry is kind of beside the point. I wanna show you the functionality and what your students will be doing more than the, the chemistry itself. But it's really just asking them to compare two things and explain their reasoning. And that's what uh, Alex was talking about a bit at the beginning with there's a lot more learning emphasis and questions that are asking students to think deeply about things instead of just which one has, it's why or how. And so here's their problem. They can go in and sketch their answer, or you can type or you can upload any kind of image. You can work on it on paper, take a picture and upload it. But I have a tablet, so I'm gonna go, okay, so I maybe I'm not sure, but let's circle this one and say, okay, because it's SP to SP2. Obviously, I should get the right answer because <laughs> it's my question. But the students can do the same sort of thing. And this one's SP2 to SP2. And if I'm happy with that, I can go upload. Oh, no, I don't want to upload. I think I'm in preview, so it might not actually go all the way. But the next one is I think there's a button here that says, you know, save and upload image. And then once they have that, I just want to move this for a sec. Because my zoom window is slightly in the way. There we go. I'll show you what it looks like from the student's perspective. Just a sec, I need to go back into this activity. So after students have, no, I don't. Why is it giving me this edit thing? Sorry. We all still have a little bit of struggles with some of these. I wanna show you what it looks like. So students can see each other's works and then comment on each other, um, which is one of the neat things about a platform like this. So, what we usually do is we set something so ahead of time they can't see each other's responses, but then you can see I have, you know, some students have uploaded different answers and other students can go in and comment and either ask a question or follow up in some way saying, you know, I really like the way you explained that or can you help understand uh, this point that you talked about, but I'm still not sure about and it's a really good way for for very focused um, feedback between students and so that worked really well um, during the summer and we plan to do that in the fall as well in multiple chemistry courses so i will stop that again and then um, if there's there's any other general questions we have a very active support system for our courses this fall um, one of the i guess biggest things so we usually have something called team which are the tomlinson engagement award for mentors these are undergraduate helpers and we always have some tas we have a record number of tas this fall i have 10 tas to help out and we have 45 team students so we have a huge amount of people helping with our organic one course and we will have very similar levels of support for the other um, entry entry level uh, chemistry courses and and the other science courses are, are all following suit fairly commonly so i think there's there's just some questions i see now about visual classrooms so it's, it is being used in a lot of the other chemistry courses and some of the other departments as well um, i don't know exactly what a lot of the other departments are doing for assessments specifically but i know that in at least the faculty of science the the change to having you know more quizzes fewer high stakes exams more participation grades more um, of that kind of thing is definitely happening across across the different departments and then i guess alex that's pretty much it for me if if you want to if there's any other questions that came up that i missed i'm sorry i, I can't see it very well when i'm screen sharing uh, thank you, Dr. Vilka. That was great getting to see some of the cool tools and the ways in which students are going to engage in their learning and really 
Um, learning uh, remotely is really no different than learning in general. It requires a lot of responsibility and autonomy of students to work outside of what we traditionally call class time. And, um, and I think that this really helps facilitate that. So I'll say, Dr. Pafelka, there were a couple of questions about remote labs in the chat. So I invite you to, to dive into those and thank you again for your presentation. Um, and now we're going to switch gears uh, to something also very exciting. I'm going to very, be, I am very pleased to introduce Professor Manuel Ballon. He's an associate professor in political science and international development studies and the incoming director of the Institute for the Study of International Development at McGill. He's the recipient of multiple teaching awards, including the 2019 McGill Principals Prize for Excellence in Teaching. As I said before, that's kind of a big deal. His research focuses on corruption, transparency, and anti-corruption policies political competition, media and politics, scandals, and the rule of law. He's the author of uh, Today's Allies, Tomorrow's Enemies, The Political Dynamics of Corruption Scandals in Latin America, uh, forthcoming from Notre Dame University Press, and co-editor of Legacies of the Left Turn in Latin America, The Promise of Inclusive Citizenship. He's co-founder, member of the executive board, and former director of Relem, Réseau d'études latino américaines de Montréal, and member of Erigal, Équipe de recherche interuniversitaire sur l'inclusion et la gouvernance en Amérique latine. Before coming to McGill, he received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, uh, Longhorns, I believe, and a law degree in Argentina, where he is originally from. Professor Ballon? Thank you, Alex. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I'll start sharing my screen right away because I have a couple of different um, things that I want to talk about and hopefully I will be able to address some of the questions that that we've already seen on the chat. So um, here I'll start the second. Okay, I'm assuming everybody can see this. Um, and so basically uh, what I wanna talk about is a, a little bit of a preview that is uh, not only about my class in particular, but about all the efforts that have been put in the Faculty of Arts to think about remote, remote teaching, remote um, learning uh, for this coming semester. So first, a few words on what this transition to remote um, learning will look like. Let me just start the slideshow here. There you go. Um, and so this transition to remote learning and teaching, arguably, or at least my sense, is that we were going in this direction anyway, right? Um, there's been a, a growth of these types of uh, engagement tools that don't necessitate uh, students to be in the classroom with professors. Um, what this has done is that the pandemic has acted as an accelerator. Basically, we we hit the, you know, we we hit the the, the accelerator pretty hard here. And what we're doing is things that you know we were thinking about doing and slowly progressing towards doing anyway. I'd say. So in this context, I think McGill did a few things quite well here, right? And I want to highlight those because I think those are very important here. First one is it acted early. And if we, if we see what's happening in other universities, um, we see how right McGill got this call, right? The transition was announced in early June. This allowed for plenty of time to prepare, to prepare for this transition, to think about what the guidelines, what it should look like, et cetera, et cetera. And this has been from my perspective as a professor and, and administrator of some units, this has been key, right? Because it has allowed us to really trickle down all the message to the individual professors and also hear professors back um, what their feedback is about the different tools and, 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 and needs that they have to have a successful semester. Um, it provided, McGill provided training, guidelines, technological resources to instructors, admin. There's been also um, training, there's training available for students as well and how to access the different tools. There's a number of different things that have been you know, put together in the last couple of months that have been very important and I think are key in how, you know, successful or not, and I, I'm really hoping that it will be a very successful term um, that's starting next week. It also, um, McGill allowed for both, you know, top-down directives of what 
different faculties thought um, each class should look like in general. Um, there were some questions in the chat about this, about how normalized all classes will be. Um, and so there was definitely space for this, for this top-down thought about, okay, this is what things should look like. But also there was a lot of space for bottom-up feedback, right? From instructors saying, you know, my course works in this way. How can I make it work within those guidelines? So there was a lot of feedback effect, a lot of, you know, back and forth to really set what the stage for what next semester will look like. And I think that that's the right approach here. Neither one nor the other are necessarily right, but if you combine them, you can get something good here. Um, and the final thing that I would say McGill did quite right is it prioritized both equity and engagement. And, and this is important because on the equity front, you want all students to have access to the materials, regardless of whether they are in a different time zone, regardless of whether you know, they have a great space to work in or they have more difficulties engaging in these fixed sessions. Um, and so, so that equity component is really, really important. But also that cannot be the only factor, right? We need to really maximize engagement. We need to make sure that students and professors can interact in a you know, active way and that you know, student to student also um, interaction can be, can be as promoted as, as much as possible. And so all the guidelines that were created, everything that was created was trying to balance these two things that are central to the approach here. Um, and so I wanted to highlight these things because you know, th this, is, this, is, this really sets the scene for what next semester will look like. So in the last few months, what have we done in the, from the Faculty of Arts? Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, mostly political science and international development. Um, but this, what I'm going to talk about is true for other departments within the Faculty of Arts as well, right? Um, so I'm, I'm the incoming director of international development at McGill. This is the, depending on how you count, second, third largest major. And, and I've been in charge of the remote transition for political science, which is the largest program in the Faculty of Arts. Um, and so, so this is uh, this speaks to a large, large chunk of, of students at McGill, but in the Faculty of Arts. But um, what I'll talk about is also true about other departments. So, aside from the university um, and the faculty guidelines, what we created are department-specific guidelines that make sure that those guidelines that come from above are adjusted to the needs of that are specific to each department. Right? And we also created lists and resources for instructors to be able to deliver their courses effectively. Um, we engaged in the process of reviewing all syllabi and provided feedback on all courses offered in political science and international development. This is over 60 classes. Um, this is, um, in, at least in my time at McGill, unprecedented. Um, teaching is usually a very decentralized activity where each professor chooses how they're going to teach this course. This has forced us to really think about structurally what do we want to be common across courses, right? And think, and this is really important from the student perspective because if we have, say, 17 different platforms that are being used all at the same time, then students are like, oh, wait, which one do I need to log in for one class, which one for the other class, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of normalization that has happened that has allowed for, I think, what will be a better student experience. Um, we held workshops and brainstorming sessions. Um, this is important because, honestly, teaching has become more of a collective effort than I've ever seen either here or at any of the other institutions that I've been a part of. Um, you know, there's been tons of energy, tons of time, tons of thought put into teaching, um, into how to effectively deliver our courses in a remote delivery environment. And this is, um, this is really important. Um, this is unprecedented. And I think in many ways, this ensures that the next semester will be different, but in many cases, um, even better than other semesters, I would argue. And this is a, you know, hopeful thinking, wishful thinking, but I think it can happen. So let me highlight some of the things that, that I've seen in other syllabi, and I'd be really brief here because I wanna talk a little bit more about my, what I'm doing in, in my class in particular. Uh, but just to give you some flavor, right? There's, there's been tons of creative assignments that have been uh, put forth by different faculty members. 
Um, one example that I, I just picked out of a silva of a colleague, this is poly 432, this is politics of art. Um, the final, instead of a final exam, what the students will be working on is a final creative project that can be, they'll be working on a podcast or a short film or an original song or a playlist, not simply the list of songs, but a written commentary in the list itself, a story, a collection of poems, a visual artwork, piece of creative nonfiction or art criticism, um, or an imagined dialogue from with one of the authors or artists whose work they engage during the class. This is as um, you know, this is political science. I had never seen stuff like this anywhere really. Um, and I think this is really exciting. This opens a whole bunch of possibilities for what work in the university would look like um, and how this can, can generate the engagement that we want here, right? Um, in multiple classes, what we've seen also are the creation of group research papers um, where you know, they have to create recorded presentations either through a podcast or a short clip. Um, and then there's sort of live discussions of those presentations. So they record the presentation and then they go into a Zoom session, a fixed Zoom session to discuss it with other students. Um, for research papers, there's been a lot of emphasis on this cumulative assessment so that students are not turning in a final paper, but are rather um, working towards that paper in different stages, uh, going through a proposal, an annotated bibliography, an outline, a draft, all with peer review process where different students are commenting on each other's work. Um, you know, this technically can be done in any regular semester, but given, but it's usually not done. And I would say it's usually not done because the energy is put somewhere else. And in this semester, the energy is being put on exactly these creative things where it's not only about us, um, you know, delivering our lectures, but it's also about the work and the learning experience from the students. And this, I think, is, is a change that is here to stay, if anything, right? I think a lot of the creative tools that we are creating right now will remain here with us um, once we go back to, you know, the regular classroom and away from Zoom sessions. Um, so let me talk a little bit about my own course. Um, I, this semester I'm teaching politics of Latin America. This is Poly 319. Um, this is a pretty large course with 170 students. Um, and so in, in terms of structure, just to give you a sense, and this is a, a typical structure for the courses in, in the Faculty of Arts for all the syllabi that I've seen, and I've seen more than I care to say. Um, is that you know the the lectures will be recorded um uh so delivered in a flexible what we call a flexible format um and so yes i will be recording myself and delivering these lectures um and then there will be live fixed conferences with discussion board alternative and i'll, I'll get into that in a second right so um the idea here is that we divide the class between the part that really requires um interaction between instructor and students and among students and the part that doesn't necessitate that interaction right and so the part that doesn't necessitate that interaction we can move to a flexible format i can record my lectures and they can watch those lectures students can watch those lectures at their own leisure at their own time right um but then the fixed sessions and the discussion board alternative is meant to um, take over that part that is the engagement part, the part in which students interact with one another and with instructors and TAs. So somebody had asked before a question about conferences. Conferences are these sort of smaller tutorial sessions that are opened um, a couple of weeks after um, the term begins. Um, so, so you will see somebody had asked about registration for these. these. This will happen over Benarba, but it will happen once the semester starts. And so there will be conferences with different schedules um, and students will be able to choose according to their schedule, according to their time zone, which conference is better for them. And these conferences will consist in, in, my, in the case of my class and most classes, of two main alternatives, right? One is you participate in the Zoom session and have the discussion in a small group. And the other one for those students who cannot connect um, for any given reason, um, they can also participate in the discussion through uh, my courses uh, and a function in my courses that is the, the discussion board, right? Where they can exchange thoughts with students on a sort of more ch chat based rather than a live interaction. Um, 
Uh, another thing to mention is, uh, so for the first time in my time at McGill, I will be personally teaching some of these live conferences. Um, and this is because I crave the student interaction and I want part of that and I have that usually in my lectures. Now I don't have it, I need it, I need to know what students are thinking and so I decided I will teach a couple of these conferences. Um, and so that, that's, that's an added plus in many ways for me as well. Um, in terms of assessment, what I'm doing with the class is there's um, four different components. The first one is participation. Um, and again, here there's multiple alternatives and formats for this participation. It can be live in a, in a Zoom meeting. It can be the chat in a Zoom meeting. It can be the discussion board. They can write response papers. There's multiple ways and functions to participate. And I'll talk about why I think that's an advantage in a second. Um, the second way that I'm, I'm planning to assess students is through a set of weekly quizzes. These are low stakes. These are continuous assessments meant more than to evaluate students to make sure that students are keeping up with the lectures, keeping up with the readings. And, you know, it's more of a self assessment more than an assessment from my part to them. So you see the weekly quizzes, they get credit just for taking them. Are you doing well in those quizzes? You get the immediate feedback on my courses. Um, you know, if you are, it means you, you're getting what you need to be getting out of the lectures, out of the, out of the readings. If you're not, then maybe it's time to get in touch with us and make sure that, that you do engage in a proper way. Um, and then um, the two main assessments are an, an, a set of movie, what I call movie essays. And these are short essays. Um, there's uh, four options and they have to choose three. Um, that asks students to connect themes in the readings and lectures that we cover with a specific movie that I assign and, and make available to them. Um, and so uh, I've used some of this in the past, but this is the first time that I'm moving all the essay, all the writing component of the class to these essays. Um, these are quite popular, students like them, I like them. Um, you know, it's, it's a way to bring down some of the sometimes more abstract and complicated concepts to, you know, a story that is linked in a movie. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting. I also like the movies that I assign, so I don't mind watching them again. Um, and I think students enjoy them too. Um, the final one is a take home final exam. And here, th this exam has both what I call more objective questions that ask for specific answers about concepts, about whether they grab something, and more subjective questions about um, you know, analysis and synthesis out of you know, connecting different readings, connecting different lectures, et cetera, et cetera. One important point about all assessments is that they are created with a wide time frame. Um, and, and when it comes to, for instance, the take home exam, and this is the case for most exams that will happen next term, there's two time frames. One is the time frame to access the exam. So students can start the exam within a period of say 48 to 72 hours. And they can choose when they start it. And once they start it, the time to complete the exam starts to run. And that time is usually quite long. So in the case of my take home exam, um, it's an exam meant to be written in two, three hours uh, most, and, and I give them 24 hours to work on it. Um, and so the idea here is not to put the, the pressure on time and performance over time, but to really make sure that students have the best ability, the best chance to you know, edit their own work and think about what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera, and, and giving a good final product there. Um, I put word limits, by the way, just to make sure that the grading doesn't get insane. Um, the bonus that I added to this class that I just finished setting this up, and this gets me quite excited also, is that each week I will be holding a guest speaker from all over the world, Global North and Global South, um, experts on each of the issues, each of the themes that we'll be talking in sort of shorter conversations with myself, that where students will be also be able to um, log in and ask questions out of these experts. Many times it's the authors of the different readings that we do for the class. Um, this, um, you know, this is a pretty unique opportunity. This is impossible to have in a regular semester and it's something that we can do this semester and that I'm really excited about doing. Uh, it takes some time to set up, but I've already set it up. Um, and so, so this I'm, I'm really excited about too. And I think it's, it's good for students to not only read people, but also get to ask questions out of those people who wrote the, you know, seminal pieces that they're reading. 
So in all, what do I see some as advantages of remote delivery? And here, what I'm arguing is that remote delivery is neither better nor worse. It's different. It allows for things that the regular semester does not allow, right? Um, and so we really need to take advantage of, of what we can do with remote delivery. And speaking about the, the, all the syllabi that I have reviewed, there's been a lot of effort to think hard about what these advantages can be and how we can maximize these advantages. So on assessments, um, there's, and, and Alex talked about this at the beginning, there's a lot of less about memory and a lot more about analysis, about synthesis, about thinking about what you read and not reciting what you read. Um, I think this is an advantage. And I think this is something that should be a transition that should be here to stay. Um, there's an emphasis on writing skills, on presentation skills, on creating sort of good finished products. Um, again, I think um, over, you know, in-class exams where, you know, students are handwriting and then we're like, okay, what did they write um, kind of thing. And, and here there's more emphasis on the type of writing skills that will be most applicable later on. Um, same in terms of presentation skills. Um, and I see that also as a, as a strong advantage. Um, there's a lot of, of classes that have project-based projects and, and, and project-based assessments and group work. Um, again, I think uh, this is something that, that needs to be emphasized more, at least in the Faculty of Arts, and something that this term I'm seeing a lot more than I've ever seen before. Um, and I think this is also an advantage. In terms of engagement, um, you know, in terms of participation, as I said before, for my class as well as other classes, we are looking for different modes of engagement here. And it's not only about speaking up in class, with, which for some students may be a little bit harder, um, but it's also about being able to express their thoughts in writing in a discussion board, in a chat, and through different formats, right? Um, and I think um, this different modes of engagement actually may play to the advantage for to different sets of advantages that students may have, right? And they may develop different skills and not only the ability to speak up in a lecture with 300 students, which is, a, you know, something good to have, but not the only thing that they should really develop in terms of participation. Um, given the emphasis on flexible lectures, I've seen across the board, more availability from instructors for one-on-one -on -one interaction. There's extended office hours, there's more availability for these type of fixed sessions. There's actually, I would say, more chance to interact with professors than what we usually see in these really, really large classes of 600 students um, in, in the Faculty of Arts. Um, and so I think that in terms of engagement, this one-on-one -on -one interaction is very important and something that, that you know, this flexible format actually allows for. Um, and then something that is also really important is I think, you know, in this way, with flexible lectures, et cetera, et cetera, students can manage the rhythm of the lectures on their own time a little bit more. They can know whether they're more of a morning person, more of an afternoon person, whether they need to listen to the lecture at double the speed because we're going too slow, or whether, you know, they need to slow us down so that they can you know, listen to the lecture a couple of times and really make sure that they're getting what they need to be getting. So this allows for more flexibility and better engagement with not only the instructor, but also the materials, right? Um, it does require a little bit more out of students. It does require them to be a little bit more self-guided. There's not a lecture at 8.30 in the morning that they need to wake up and go there and wear in their pajamas. Um, but um, but they now, now they can still wear their pajamas, don't get me wrong. Um, but they can, you know, at, attend that lecture multiple times in whichever way they want. Um, and so those are, I, I think, are the advantages of uh, remote delivery. With that, um, I'll send it back to Alex. Thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Bellin, and I really appreciate that you set out a nice coherent argument um, as a former graduate of a couple different faculties of the arts that hit home in many ways. 
um, although I think in another life I might have been a scientist. So um, at this point, we're in the final 15 minutes of the session. So I really invite um, everyone to put some, as many questions as they can in the chat, take advantage of this great opportunity. Um, even I work at McGill, I've been here for three years. It's not every day that I get to spend an hour with uh, some of our best instructors. Um, so I encourage you all to take the opportunity to engage. Um, but what I will do is say a little bit about what goes on beyond the classroom, um, specifically in terms of resources and supports to ensure that students are successful as remote learners, um, just as we would want them to be successful learning in general. Um, so what I'm going to do is drop a link in the chat. Um, if you're not already aware, there's this brand new remote student life portal that'll have uh, tons of amazing information to help your students and all students at McGill navigate this new virtual environment. And I wanna draw special attention to the academics tab. So under that academics tab, you're gonna find information about workshops, resources, programs, including the Office for the Student of Disabilities for any student that requires accommodations to help them with remote learning strategies. Um, you know, learning uh, in secondary school often puts a lot of emphasis on memorization and things and, and so, so forth. And we're already talking about an increased emphasis on analysis and interpretation and the application of concepts. And frankly, the way you study to memorize should not and is not the same as the way you study to apply concepts. And um, often that can be a difficult transition for many students. And so what we do is we have a number of programs and workshops and resources all available um, online for your students to take full advantage of, including the Skills 21 program for undergraduate students, um, a suite of webinars and um, on a number of topics, everything from learning strategies to leadership, time management and strategic procrastination and so forth. And I really want to key in on something that was said that this notion of more frequent assessments, so more frequent assignments and quizzes and tools, um, it encourages students to keep up with the work. Um, you know, if, if you put everything else off to the last minute, it's going to be very, very difficult. If you've ever tried to flush uh, a box of cereal a dry cereal down your kitchen sink very quickly for whatever reason, uh, it doesn't all go through. So, you know, this idea of keeping up on your assignments, um, it'll help boost motivation, it'll help boost focus, and it will really encourage student success. So I, um, please um, share that link with your students, check it out yourself, see what programs are there, and, um, and take full advantage of everything that kind of surrounds that curricular, that classroom component at McGill, and there is a lot. So let's see, we've got a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, there have been a number of questions regarding uh, live lectures versus recorded lectures. And so um, what we're doing right now, let's call it a fixed activity, a synchronous activity, a live lecture. Um, lect lecturing often means um, one-sided content delivery, but I think as was, um, highlighted uh, when we're joining for these fixed sessions, we want to solve problems. We want to put students in small groups and actually um, Zoom does something really cool with that. But so the idea is that some things will be uh, available online and as much as possible, I strongly encourage that instructors record that and put that in my courses so students can access it later, uh, especially if they're unable to attend at a certain time and encourages the equity and engagement. Um, and on the topic of the small groups, um, so we're about 213 in this, uh, this little mini course online right now. That's really cool. And we're all from all over the world. Now, what if we wanted to say, hey, it's really hard to have some kind of more intimate discussions uh, and dig in a little bit deeper in such a large group. Well, Zoom, which is what we're using right now, which is what's used for remote teaching, actually allows instructors to convene small groups within the meeting. So we can actually send you all to what's called breakout rooms. And in those uh, rooms, students can work on small group discussions, problem solving, and then come back and then debrief with the instructors. So uh, again, making full use of the tools that we have in support of student learning. So let's see. Have, um... oh, thank you. Let's make sure I put the link back in the chat. So there's a question here about uh, uniformity uh, across all courses and faculties. So by and large, the type of assessment that you might do, right, and, and an exam, a project, a quiz, an assignment, it might look different 
in, let's say, STEM as opposed to the arts or otherwise. Um, but some of those guidelines about making uh, you know, flexible timelines, allowing students to complete them at their own um, in a time that is best suited for them and making sure that's clear in their course outline, which we also call the syllabus. Um, that's something that uh, is taking place across the university, but the actual nature of the assignment will be really tied to whatever the learning goals of that specific course are. Um, so there was, a, there was a question I know floating around about the student ID. I did see uh, Laura put a link to the ID information page uh, in there before. I'll see if we can dig that up there. There it is. Thank you, Julie. So there's a question obviously about the winter semester. We're getting ready to kick off the fall. And we're thinking about the winter. Uh, plans have not been made yet for that i would expect them to be forthcoming you can be rest assured that uh you know we're looking closely at the situation as it evolves and and I, we're already ramping up in-person activities on campus uh we're going to be having some teaching hubs students who are able to be in the montreal area will have access to uh, campus spaces and many student services and frontline personnel will be returning at reduced capacity in order to be able to service those who are in the community So this one's actually for uh, Professor Pavelka and Professor Badin. Uh, how would you feel comfortable sharing your uh, your PowerPoint with participants after the session? Uh, keep in mind the recording will be shared later, so you will have access to it no matter what. Perfect. No problem. Perfect. It's a question here um, about flexibility in terms of taking classes across the faculties um, so students are you know able to take the courses that they want within their program pending prerequisites and things like that so i think uh, let me put a question uh, to our professors here we have on the call this is uh, we have them here um, you mentioned uh, in a couple of different ways, but just really to highlight some of the real positives that have come of this. Some of you, maybe if we just get your final comments about, based on your experiences and knowledge about remote teaching and learning so far. So, what are some things that you're really excited to see kind of continue when we can return to being campus based? And maybe we'll start with Professor Pavelka. Sure, thanks, Alex. Um, Honestly, over the, the last six months, we've seen a huge amount of change in terms of professors putting a lot more effort into updating their courses, trying new technologies, trying new methods of delivery, um, instead of just relying on the same old, same old, because you couldn't anymore. And so I think there's been a lot of positive change in a fairly dire situation, but usually that's what leads to paradigm shift. And I think that's what we're really seeing. I think university education will not ever be the same in a really good way. I think we're pushing more for those smaller assessments, maybe more student interactivity and peer-to-peer -peer activities. And I don't think that will change when we go back to in-person. Um, one thing that Zoom has allowed for our really big classes is that everyone's in the front row. And so I think, um, I can't take credit for that. That's a Ken Reagan original uh, quote. There's one of our physics profs. And even if we go back to Lee Cock or our big lecture rooms, I think we will continue to have some online activities that really support them in small group environments um, because we're gonna be very practiced at that. And it will be a, quite a hybrid experience, but taking all the best from this remote delivery experience along with us. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your participation today, everyone. It's been, it's been great to try and answer everyone's questions. I'm sorry if I missed anything. Um, it's a lot of it's a lot of people. So I wish you all the best and all the best for your your children this fall. I guess adult children this fall <laughs> at McGill. Thank you, Professor Rafalka. Actually, there's a question here in the chat for Professor Ballon um, about workload, which I have just lost because you're all being very great chat it's engaged. Right. No Perfect. So, so um, let me start with that in terms of workload, uh, because I think this is actually gets at something that, that should be thought about moving forward and not only about this term. 
one transition that has happened, at least in the Faculty of Arts, and I think this is, this is extended to the whole university, is rethinking what course load means, right? What the hours mean in terms of contact hours. It used to be that a three credit course meant 39 contact hours. This meant um, students in a classroom with a professor for a total of 39 hours, um, that's three hours per week for 13 hours. Well, for 13 weeks, right? And so this is how we thought. And we didn't think about the type of hours or time that students would be spending on this course outside the classroom. Yeah, there were some thought about this, but it wasn't systematic. Well, now we moved away from that contact hour calculation. So it's no longer 39 hours. Um, this is not the way that we are thinking about this, but what we're thinking about this is, a, whole course, a whole three credit course, such as the one that I'm teaching this term, um, should take in total um, between reading, between classwork, between assessment, assignments, uh, attending lectures, all of it. The whole package should be at roughly 135 hours. And I think this is a, a good move, right? This is a good move because it allows us to be more realistic about what we are expecting out of students. It allows students to have better expectations about how much time they should be spending in their classes, right? And so if you think about the whole term, um, you know, uh, this is 13 weeks. This is roughly, the calculation is that roughly one course, one three credit course should take about 10 hours of work a week. Um, you know, for students that are taking, uh, you know, four courses, this means roughly they should be working 40 hours a week in some way or another, right? Um, I think this is a more reasonable way of thinking about work. This is a more reasonable way of thinking about how we load our students with readings and, and lecture time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and so, so the answer, this, the one sentence answer to um, the question is for each three credit course, students should be working roughly 130, 135 hours per term for the whole term, right? Um, this goes to 10 hours a week. Um, and, and we should think about how we allocate that time. Um, let me get to another couple of things that I think are important in terms of, of uh, things that will stay. Um, there's been a number of questions about, about access to readings, access to books. Um, I think the, the question about access in general can be thought of be going beyond the readings and is one that, that we are thinking a lot about and that we should, you know, make the adjustments that we're making now permanent. Um, for all the readings, there's been a, a, cons a very detailed effort to make sure that students can access the readings from wherever they are in the world, et cetera, et cetera, and they have alternatives to how to access those readings, right? Um, this is essential now when we're not requiring students to, to be in campus, but if you think about it, it's essential in any term. Um, and so thinking a little bit more about access, access to the readings, but also access to the lectures and access to the class materials, access to our PowerPoints, access to our class notes, access to everything that the student needs in order to do well in those courses and learn what they are supposed to be learning um, is something that, that we need to guarantee. Um, and I think the, the, what this semester has put really highlighted is how much we need to emphasize this capacity of providing access to all of this. Um, and so I think that's a, another thing. Um, and this encompasses also the lectures. I think flexible access to lectures is in some ways here to stay um, to some degree or another. Um, so, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll stay there and not talk too much. Thank you so much. I, I, we're at time. I just want to conclude by reminding everybody that McGill students are still the best and brightest in the world. And are, we still have world-class researchers that are leading these courses as instructors. Um, strong emphasis on the learning is really one of my takeaways from today. And I really had a, a, a great experience being able to see behind the curtain um, at what students are going to experience in the classroom environment. I would like to thank both Professor Vallant and Dr. Pavelka for taking the time to be with us today. I'd like to thank all of you for your uh, really fantastic and often very challenging questions in the chat. I hope that we answered as many of them as we could in this time. A uh, little reminder that the recording will be available, I think, roughly around September 2nd. The alumni office will get that out. 
Um, I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good night, no matter where you're joining from. And have a great day, everybody. Thank you.